I add my welcome to Lawrence's for everyone coming here this evening. Uh, I'm very happy to see so many of you joining us tonight. And I was thinking about the last time we had this many people for an event, and it was uh, the last time Mr. Greenwood came. Uh, so we obviously either have to do better or invite him monthly. Now, um, I'm here just to introduce John, but you probably already know more about him um, than you need to. Uh, and you've got the bio where we circulated the invitation. But I want to add just a few things about what great value John is to an audience in Hong Kong, uh, to which he returns far too infrequently. Of course, everyone knows about him as father of the peg, and as I said last year, the mother of the peg is also <laughs> but his, his, um, his experience in Hong Kong goes uh, much further than advising um, the uh, British government in the 80s to institute PEG. Uh, he was the director of the Future of the Exchange and later of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for a number of years and has been on, uh, on the board of the Currency Board Operations of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Um, for a very long time, uh, which I think is extremely important to Hong Kong. And maybe uh, not many citizens of Hong Kong realise how important that is, to have people on that type of structure with the background that he has and the memory of instituting the PEG, which obviously gets attacked on, on a not infrequent basis. So those of us who value the st stability of financial markets in Hong Kong, I think, ought to be ensuring, trying to ensure that John stays uh, in these roles. Um, but of course he also has um, a, a private market background and his role is Invesco in giving advice, practical advice which has to be investable to their customers I think is also important. It means that he's had a, a public uh, advice side and a private advice side uh, which is um, not quite unique, but it's unusual and I think uh, extremely important for a group like Man Rock. Now last year John spoke about the tangled structure of the WTO and, and other um, intricate trade arrangements. Um, this year uh, I hope he will put some historical context around the US-China row on trade and what it might mean for Hong Kong. As he does so, I think it's striking how the fevered debate um, which I think is probably the right word, on Brexit in the UK, um, seems completely dominated by an existential fear of a Britain bereft of a set of government-to-government -government trade deals. I mean, the impression is that when people wake up in the morning and want to feel some stability and not terror, they want to check how many bilateral trade deals their government has signed. Now, how you've got an entire population to think that the world will end without these government-to-government -government relationships is, is beyond me. And one might well note that Hong Kong has done pretty well without any. But perhaps the last point I'd add is there may be no government policy in history outside war that has damaged its citizens more than trade tariffs. And yet we still have them and almost every government in the world still wants more of them. And perhaps John will explain to us how on earth we got into this situation and how we might get out of it. So, microphone over to you, Mr. Greenwood. That's a classic <laughs> And while John speaks, we get to eat the main course and he <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Nick, um, for that very effusive welcome. And um, the big challenge you've set me, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to explain fully um, what you said um, about trade agreements. But anyway, I'm going, my sign topic was um, the outlook for trade in this part of the world uh, in the light of the ongoing uh, US-China uh, fracas over trade, and um, I thought I'd do that 
in a in a way that um, maybe a little bit more light-hearted, at least to begin with, uh, than is normal. Um, and I thought I'd do that by uh, starting out with a little bit of discussion about trade in the early days in this part of the world. <coughs> and I'll then get into the sort of nitty-gritty of uh, what drives trade in the underlying sense, and then talk about tariffs uh, and a little bit about non-tariff barriers. So that's uh, the agenda. Um, and I'm going to start off then with uh, trade in this part of the world, uh, as I've called it, in the early days, um, which is really from about the 15th century, 16th century onwards, um, when silver uh, ruled the world. Um, all the countries pretty much from Japan down to Indonesia and across to India uh, relied on the silver standard. Japan, it's true, and parts of China had areas where there were different standards. Um, in Japan, they had, for a while, they had an iron standard in some parts, some areas. In China, there was a copper standard in certain areas. <coughs> but predominantly, uh, silver uh, was the common currency. So in a sense, Asia had a currency union <coughs> uh, way before you know, we had international uh, monetary unions of the modern kind. <coughs> they started, it started out really with um, the Portuguese and the Spanish competing to discover routes to the Spice Islands, along with the Dutch to a lesser degree, later the British. Uh, but initially, the Portuguese and the, the Spanish. And as you probably know, they div divided the world down the Atlantic and said pretty much everything to the, uh, the west of that uh, was Portuguese, we're going to be Portuguese, and everything to the east of it was, um, was Spanish. Um, and Spain was able to uh, develop uh, quite a big presence in uh, Mexico and places like that, with the result that um, they <coughs> discovered silver. And in the 1560s or thereabouts, uh, <coughs> some navigators discovered that they could sail from, not just from Mexico to the Philippines uh, and Asia, but they could sail back uh, across the North Pacific, which was a, quite a big innovation, the, the return route. And once they were able to do that, then they were able, able to bring all the uh, spices and the products from Asia to Mexico, and then from there, uh, to Europe. Uh, so that was an important kind of link. And so you basically had Manila galleons, as they were called, uh, going from the west coast of the Americas to Asia, uh, loaded with silver, and picking up goods in Asia, and then going back to um, the Americas. And then, and, and, and in that way, uh, Spain was able to kind of avoid uh, a lot of the competition with the Portuguese and, and, and others. So this um, trade lasted for at least a couple of hundred years. Initially, uh, the currency that was used was primarily Spanish and Mexican silver dollars. Um, and later, uh, other countries like uh, Britain and France minted their own silver dollars. And you can still find these all over Asia. Um, my wife, who's here tonight, my wife and I have just been in Cambodia. And I was able to pick up a few more of these silver dollars. Now, they're still lying around. Uh, and in various markets, you can uh, pick them up. So I have for your 
uh, delight I'm going to pass them around. Um, some Philippine issued currency, uh, a couple of examples of the Morgan dollar from the US, um, a British dollar uh, from uh, Hong Kong, uh, a, 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 a French piastre from Southeast Asia, from Indochina, um, and uh, what have I left out? Uh, and also, of course, the Spanish dollar. So, uh, so these are just fun to look at, and pass, I'll pass them around. There are 10 of them. I'm very anxious to get them back on. <laughs> <laughs> I normally pass these around my students uh, that I teach in Cardiff and Edinburgh and places like that uh, when I'm teaching them about monetary standards. Uh, because obviously, although these coins circulated until the, the, 19, the mid 1930s in most areas, but uh, until the 1950s in Indochina and places. Um, they were increasingly replaced with banknotes. And the banknote essentially is a certificate in this part of the world representing those coins. Those of you who've been in Hong Kong a number of years will probably remember that the old notes, like this one, which is a bit older than most of us, it was um, issued in uh, July 1920, uh, says on it, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation promises to pay the bearer on demand at its office here $500, or the equivalent in the currency of the colony full stop, period. And now the two most important words, value received. What that means is that we, the bank, have received 500 of those dollars that are currently being passed around, and we have that or the equivalent in our vaults. They were only able to issue these banknotes against that those kind of um, holdings of silver coin, silver bullion, uh, Chinese equivalent, Saisi, and things like that. And in addition, these notes in the old days were signed, hand signed. Uh, so you've got two signatures here uh, from the uh, general manager or chief accountant, whatever, uh, at the time. So the banknote literally represented those coins and you could go to the bank, hand in your banknote and receive the coins in exchange. Nowadays you can't do that. Nowadays of course the wording on the notes is pretty much meaningless. So here's one, they're all the same. Standard Charter Bank, uh, Hong Kong Limited promises to pay the bearer on demand at its office here $500 by order of the Board of Directors. There's no, there's no, there's no convertibility. So, in the in in the period that we're talking about, <coughs> money was literally convertible into silver, and uh, because silver was the currency of all these countries, uh, trade between them was considerably facilitated. Uh, because they didn't have to take account of uh, the price of silver moving, say, against the price of gold. Um, and you didn't have to worry about some dictator you know, printing money. Most of these uh, countries relied on uh, a, sil a convertible silver standard, uh, which remained intact right up until 1935. But then it went wrong. And what went wrong was, although there have been a couple of episodes of it in the 19th century, what went wrong was that during the Great Depression in the United States, there was a lot of unemployment in the 
for the mining industry. Commodity prices fell sharply, and therefore mining employment fell. And to encourage employment in the mining states, Congress was induced to pass the Silver Purchase Act of 1934, under which the price of silver was raised from roughly then 25 cents an ounce to a dollar 29. The Treasury undertook to pay a dollar 29 for every ounce of silver that was submitted to it. Of course, that generated a lot of feverish activity in the silver mines and raised employment, which is exactly what was wanted. But the effect in this part of the world was devastating because countries like China, like Hong Kong, which were on the silver standard, were in effect being forced to appreciate their exchange rate fourfold in the midst of the Great Depression. Disaster. So China gave up the silver standard. Hong Kong switched from a silver standard to a sterling standard. The government took over the reserves of the, the silver reserves of the banks here, sold the silver on London markets and replaced it with holdings of gilt edge securities. That formed the backing for the exchange fund, which in turn issued to the banks certificates of indebtedness, which effectively said, we the government owe you some amount of money, but in exchange you are allowed to issue banknotes. And we still have that system in place here today. So banks that want to issue banknotes here have to buy <coughs> certificates of indebtedness. Nowadays they pay US dollars, then they were paying sterling at a fixed rate, now they pay US dollars at a fixed rate, and um, that meant the and so Hong Kong switched from a silver standard to a sterling standard. For China, though, they didn't have such a fallback, and instead they didn't replace silver with anything, and gradually with the Kuomintang running China, the printing presses ran faster and faster, especially with the Japanese invasion and then the Civil War. And ultimately, there was a hyperinflation in China, which effectively sealed the fate of, um, of uh, the, the Kuomintang, um, Chiang Kai-shek. And so you can say, in effect, that the American Silver Purchase Act pretty much guaranteed the victory of the communists in China. It's a nice bit of monetary history. So everything then, I mean, up until 1935, the focus was on the price of silver. It was really important. And interestingly, too, in, prior to all of that little episode, because the silver price had been falling through the 1920s, the, the blue arrow at the bottom left of this chart, uh, China, uh, and Asia generally, and we're, we're doing pretty well during the um, deflation years of the 1920s. So silver had served Asia pretty well, but the problem, and this is a problem with any commodity currency, is that if you have a commodity-based currency, somebody else can manipulate the price, and then you're screwed, because that's your exchange rate out of your control. So I'm quite confident in predicting that we will never see any country adopt a commodity standard. It's a very dangerous thing to do. It's conceivable that somebody or some country could adopt a commodity basket, uh, but that's a very different thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's really like a, a kind of indexed um, currency. So. Uh, Trade in those days was largely um, freewheeling and um, you know, based on silver. And um, I think uh, what we are seeing today is something very different. So moving on to the current era, um, what I wanted to talk about was briefly the sort of 
framework that I like to use in thinking about trade and then uh, discuss with you um, the current environment. So a lot of people think that you know, it's trade that drives business or, and uh, but it's actually sort of the other way around. It's the business cycle that drives trade. As people get uh, richer, you know, uh, they want to buy more things, they want to buy more and, uh, better quality items and more exotic items, and that requires them, requires people to specialize. So specialization uh, means that people are going to be trading across national borders, and, and uh, that will, the, the volume of that will vary depending on the state of the business cycle. But the business cycle works pretty much like this. Um, you, if you have a set of monetary conditions which are eased, let's say, and growth in money and credit accelerates, then that will tend to feed through into asset prices, and that in turn will impact economic activity through what we call the wealth effect. And if the stimulus to money and credit growth persists for long enough, uh, eventually we will get some inflation. So there are different lags here, lags um, between these different phases, but roughly speaking, the lag between changes in money growth and changes in inflation is about two years. And that's why central banks around the world today have a forecasting horizon of about two years. So if you read any report by um, the Bank of England, or if you look at the Fed dot plots, they go out two to three years. So that's one economy. But we're talking about trade. So what we're interested in is the interaction of the business cycle in one economy with the business cycle of other economies. And to do that, I like to present that this way. So we've got two sets of monetary policies going on in two different countries. And across the balance of payments, that will show up in things like interest rates, in short-term capital flows. Those divergences or convergences will tend to affect um, financial flows. Asset prices will be affected in different ways by the domestic policies. And in turn, that will drive long-term capital flows, another part of the balance of payments. And then there is the impact on economic activity. <coughs> and that includes things like spending on consumption, investment, government spending, um, how tight the labor market is, and so on. And that will affect trade, and services, trade in goods and services, uh, primarily their volumes, uh, because it's the volume of economic activity which impacts the amount of physical goods required or uh, the volume of services required. But prices also come into it because if one country is having inflation and the other is not, and there's some kind of let's say quasi fixed exchange rate between the two then one country will become relatively more competitive and the other country will become less competitive. And so inflation affects competitiveness. So here we've got, the, if you like, the entire balance of payments uh, from working from this end. Competitiveness, uh, trade flows, long-term capital flows, short-term capital flows, uh, all interacting together because of what's going on in these economies. So to predict what is going to happen to Asian trade over the next year, two years, three years, we need to know what these flow charts look like for the big countries in the area. And principally I'm going to take uh, the US uh, where money and credit growth is pretty anemic. It's pretty slow. Um, now, what I've put on this chart 
is the standard M2, which is not a bad uh, forecaster of nominal spending. It's not very good because the US has a lot of financial activity that is just outside the, the regulated banking system, outside the regulated perimeter. And we call that the shadow banking system. <clears throat> and the shadow banks are illustrated with these, with the, with the dark blue line. Um, this is a definition uh, from that is used by some people at the, the, the BIS and previously to, previous to that, uh, Professor Shin at Princeton. But what you can see is that the blue line, which is essentially money in the banking system, has really not grown very much or rap at all rapidly since the, the, the crisis here in 2008-09. It's been in the mid single digits and recently has slowed to about four, four and a half percent. But even prior to the crisis, you couldn't really have told that the crisis was going to happen if you were only looking at the blue line, that is money in the banking system. You had to be aware of what was happening in the shadow banking system, which is the dark blue line. Incidentally, these are all year on year changes. And the two areas that I've highlighted in red are the areas of the tech bubble in the 90s, when you can see there was very rapid growth of shadow banking, and then the housing bubble of the early 2000s. Come the crisis, shadow banks collapsed and really have not re recovered at all until just recently we have a little bit of an uptick, but it's quite small. And this is mainly in the repo market. Um, so this is nothing like you know, what we had here or what we had there. And overall, I think this is going to mean that in spite of most of the Wall Street economists telling us for the first nine months of last year that the US economy was going to be overheated, um, and in spite of uh, Trump's fiscal stimulus, in point of fact, uh, spending is going to be pretty subdued in the US, probably growing at uh, not much more than 4 or 5% in nominal terms, which will mean that uh, at best it's going to be 2 to 3% real. So we're not going to get a surge of the US anytime soon. Just file that away. And then look at the Eurozone. Uh, here I've drawn the chart a little differently because we need to just vary things. Um, the ECB, as you're probably aware, has just completed its QE program. That means that it will not be expanding its balance sheet from here onwards. And that dark blue line at the top, which is indexed to 100 back in March of 2015 when they started their program, this will level off. And then at some point, presumably, they will start to diminish their balance sheet. But the key point is this, that in spite of expanding the balance sheet of the central bank, the balance sheets of the commercial banks have hardly grown at all, and bank lending is flat on the floor. So this is analogous to the Fed giving up QE, but the bank's not making any loans. In in fact, when the, the, when the Fed stopped doing QE, US banks were lending at a rate of about 8% per annum. Lending had recovered. <clears throat> the banks were creating credit. If you create credit, you are effectively creating money on the other side of the balance sheet, the deposits. But in Europe, that does not look as if that would be happening, because uh, everybody knows what a dire state uh, some of the European banks are in. So Europe also is going to be uh, a slow growth area going forward. And then uh, Japan, it's again a similar story. Japan's bubble of course was way back in the 1980s, peaked in 1980, December 1989 in the stock market, about a year and a half later in the real estate market. But ever since then, um, the blue line, which is money growth, has been 
seldom less than 4%, most of the time less than that, and nominal spending, nominal GDP, uh, which I've shifted one year forward, you know, uh, has most of the time remained below that too. So again, there's no basis for Japan suddenly perking up. So we've got the three big areas, the US, Japan, uh, and the Eurozone, likely to, re to remain somewhat subdued, basically more of the same. So very low inflation, pretty weak economic growth, not nothing um, dramatically exciting. So what is that going to mean for trade? First of all, just a little bit of background. You are thoroughly aware, I'm sure, that uh, China now dominates regional trade. Uh, the green line here is the Chinese exports um, reported in the US dollars. Uh, the blue line is Japanese exports, which have really not gone anywhere much since the crisis, uh, pretty flat. And um, then the next two are uh, Korea uh, in black and um, Taiwan in red. And these four all report their trade numbers pretty early. Uh, so you know, it's useful to track them. Taiwan and, and Korea come out first, but then the others are, are quite close behind. So China is exporting uh, was it two point, nearly, nearly getting on for $2.3 trillion worth a year. Um, th these are monthly figures, uh, so you have to multiply them up. <coughs> um, taking the region as a whole, before the crisis there was a tremendous boom, obviously. Um, we had th that period here when uh, Asian exports grew about 20% per annum in dollar terms, and at the same time, the OECD countries uh, were growing and moderately over here on the right, at about 3%. <coughs> uh, then we had the big China stimulus after the crisis, which revived things at least initially, but then you know, we had something of a ski slope downwards uh, until 2016, and then a bit of a revi revival in 1780. But the latest figures here for, for China uh, have turned down sharply. Um, so, Asian trade is very largely dependent on what happens in the developed world. That's no surprise to anybody who thinks about it, um, and it's well known to everybody here. Um, what I want to spend a few moments on now is whether China can turn things around. And I'm <coughs> frankly very skeptical. I wrote a piece recently called um, China Boxed In. Many of the things that were previously easy to do are no longer easy for them to do. In particular, their external surpluses registered by the black line, the blue line, um, have virtually disappeared. Um, so if they were to stimulate domestic spending, their trade accounts and their current account would start to look a lot more adverse, and they would need capital inflows to finance that. So it's not easy for them to step on the accelerator in the way that they did back in the crisis period when they had these big surpluses. So that freedom of action is no longer available to China. Um, incidentally, the this is something I like to do every now and then, check on the figures. Um, you probably know that any country will have a current account surplus or deficit which is related to the difference between its spending, its saving and its investment. And if you do the numbers for China, this is what you get. So this is the black is the current account balance as a percentage of GDP. And the red is the difference between national savings and national investment as a percentage of GDP. And these lines should line up precisely. Um, but 
Well, here they obviously did not. Um, here wasn't bad, but recently, oops, had a bit of a divergence. So um, hopefully China will improve its uh, statistical uh, processes at some point, but um, I think it will probably not be in my lifetime. Um, the Yuan, of course, has weakened against this backdrop, in spite of the fact that money growth has tightened or slowed. Um, that's perhaps not surprising. <laughs> Um, and China's own export performance it looks very much like what I just showed you for the Asian picture as a whole, except China's export growth was nearer 30% over that boom period of the early 2000s. And as I just mentioned, this latest figure here uh, has moved to negative. Uh, the, these data are quarterly, so they kind of smooth it a bit, but uh, on the latest monthly data, we're back in negative territory. That's probably uh, tariff related, but it's also related to the slowdown in the Chinese economy. So the, the external sort of freedom of, the, the freedom of action that came from a strong external account is no longer present. Second, if they were to stimulate that would be in conflict with their aspiration to um, rebalance the economy. Now, the mantra had been that they were going to rebalance the economy by boosting consumption, the black line here, as a percentage of GDP. Well, it's picked up marginally. But if they were to boost spending, which traditionally they always did through credit to the state-owned enterprises, that would boost investment, the, the red line again, and push consumption down. So it's unlikely that we're going to get that sort of classic um, credit-led, state-owned enterprise-funded type of stimulus. And that's why we're starting to see these personal tax cuts and other measures of that kind. Actually, what China needs is a lot of microeconomic reform as opposed to sort of putting their foot on the macroeconomic accelerator. Uh, but under President Xi, it doesn't look to me as if that is going to happen. Um, so here's what typically happened in the past. They would put their foot on the accelerator. Uh, the, the red line would shoot up. This is credit to the state-owned enterprises or um, ch changing the rate of change of credit. And the black line is uh, fixed asset investment by SOEs. So you've got one very clear episode there during, and that's the uh, stimulus policy after the crisis, and then an another episode here. Um, but as I say, I think it's much harder for them to do that, and they're less, li less likely to do that. Uh, furthermore, a third reason is, of course, leverage. Um, they've uh, been singing the song for a couple of years now that they're going to deleverage the economy. Uh, we've seen that language softened from deleveraging to sort of consolidating to something more uh, gradual. Um, and but I, I think that uh, given the debt levels, they're not likely to want to. As I say, put their foot on the macroeconomic accelerator again. Um, and then finally, another reason that they are constrained uh, is that they've already had three bubbles or three cycles, I should say, perhaps in the housing industry since 2008. So there's one, two, three. And associated with that, we've had surges in producer price indices of different kinds. So these blue and green lines, purple, blue, green and purple lines are different measures of producer prices. And you can see by and large, they generally move with house prices because house, houses involve a lot of basic raw materials, whether it's cement or steel or copper or um, you name it. Um, so mm, to stimulate the economy, they would have to induce another surge of this kind, which I think, again, they're reluctant to want to do. 
uh, given that that um, mortgage debt has risen a lot and um, there are some issues of, of equity too. Uh, those who've benefited from these surges, um, you know, and there are those who have not. So in all these ways, China is not going to kind of be able to break out of the rather subdued picture that I've been painting for all those other major economies, the US, the Eurozone, and Japan. Um, and therefore, I think we're likely to see a much more subdued cycle going forward. My general view is that the way to think about emerging markets is that if the red line represents the business cycle upswing of the developed markets, the emerging markets tend to have a shorter, sharper cycle superimposed on that of the developed markets. So for example, this blue line, you know, <coughs> think of it as China, um, had a sharp downturn along with the developed markets in 2008-9, recovered much more rapidly because they had balance sheets in good shape, they were able to put their foot hard on the accelerator and recover quickly, but then realized that they'd overdone it, had to put their foot on the brake, and um, we had a bit of a downturn. Um, now, as I said, in, depending on what you look at, in China, we've had those three cycles in housing already uh, in the space of a single US expansion. But that's nothing unusual. In the 1990s, when the US had the longest recorded financial expansion, went from March of 1991 to March of 2001, exactly 10 years, Asia had no less than three boom-bust episodes. So all the countries from, China, from Korea, Taiwan, down through Hong Kong, <coughs> Malaysia, Thailand, etc., all had three boom busts superimposed on a single expansion in the US. So China's kind of experience in this upswing is nothing different, nothing unusual. Um, <coughs> if we look at the Chinese money numbers, um, what we we're seeing is that uh, money growth, which is the red, the black line, excuse me, the black line has been steadily slowing down. <clears throat> we have, um, we've had roughly 18 months now of single digit growth, uh, which we had not seen uh, any time really since 1978. Uh, and so what that's implying is that the red line, which is nominal GDP growth, is also likely to slow. So China is starting to look rather like the US, the Eurozone, Japan. Uh, growth is uh, slowing in real terms, but uh, inflation too is going to be very low. We've just had a, an inflation number below 2%, and I think you know, it's quite possible we will have negative, uh, another revisit of deflation uh, going forward. So. That's kind of the cyclical picture. <clears throat> Let me finish up with a word or two on tariffs uh, and the current dispute. Um, tariffs have a bad name, or an especially bad name, uh, among economists and historians because of the Smoot Hawley tariff of June 1930. Uh, these two congressmen uh, put together the, the I think one, one was a senator, one was a congressman. Anyway, they put together this uh, tariff act in the, June 1930 when the economy was turning down weakening. At the time, you can see the US was a pretty much a, a high tariff country. It had lowered <coughs> tariffs uh, off, uh, during and after the Second World War, but then in the First World War, and then raised them again after the Second World, after the First World War, and then here is the Smoot-Hawley tariff when they were raised sharply to an average level of close to 60 percent, phenomenally high level, compared with what we've had since the implementation of the GATT um, and the WTO in the post-war years. Because of that act. Many historians said, well, that was followed by the Great Depression, 1931 to 33, 
They raised tariffs, then we had the Great Depression. One follows the other, one must cause the other. So tariffs caused the Great Depression. Uh, today we know that's wrong. Um, what actually caused the Great Depression was the collapse in money and credit. Um, these are data from the famous study by uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz on what happened to money in the United States during the 1920s and 30s when the stock of money between October 1929 and the end of 1933, the cumulative decline was something of the order of 35%, depending on which definition you use. <coughs> Now we had something quite similar start to happen in 2008. That is, after the Lehman bankruptcy, I showed you earlier those figures for the shadow banking system and how it collapsed. If the Fed had not done QE, then we would have had the danger of a repetition of the Great Depression. But I mean, it, it was because the Fed sat on its hands during the 19, early 1930s that they had the Great Depression. They had four years of negative GDP, um, four years of deflation, and unemployment hit 25%. Uh, so this, this is what is crucial to domestic spending uh, rather than the tariffs. And because the, the central banks did QE this time, they avoided that kind of collapse. And that ensured that, by and large, in most countries, uh, money growth didn't collapse. It con continued to grow. The counterpart was not lending, but new reserves. So um, looking forward, uh, what's important is that the central banks do their job in ensuring that money and credit growth remain positive, uh, or more than positive. Um, certainly in the major countries, something like 4% is about a minimum growth rate uh, that we need. Um, and, then, uh, and then some for countries that grow faster. Uh, so it's not the tariffs that caused the Great Depression, it was the contraction in money and credit, the collapse of the banking system. Um, now, of course, Mr. Trump is uh, doing his own thing, and this is from last September from Deutsche Bank. Um, when those tariffs were imposed, that was roughly the tariff level that was reached, and of course, since then, there hasn't been any addition of tariffs, and you know, there's this nervousness about you know, whether we'll go to the 25% level uh, in March. Um, hopefully we won't, but even if we did, what I've just said means that um, we would not have a collapse of the big items of GDP, consumption, investment, government spending. Those things are driven by money and credit. The trade part of GDP is a relatively small bit at the end. It's the plus x minus m. And in fact, it's the, diff it's the change in the difference between those two. <coughs> so um, while tariffs are bad news, they are, they're not <coughs> uh, the kind of disaster that was um, alleged for the smooth horny tariff in 1930. Um, what is bad news, um, <coughs> equally bad news, is, is the non-tariff barriers. And here the US is no paragon of virtue, and most other countries, I'm afraid, <coughs> are doing the same thing. So we have a massive range of uh, regulations, restrictions, um, and controls, and barriers on entry, uh, disguised as minimum standards, and um, so on, uh, which, you know, Superficially sound great, but actually uh, they uh, inhibit innovation and experimentation. So I think it's very difficult to say that um, you know, the tariffs are really bad because these non-tariff barriers are, are equal, if equally constraining, if not even worse. And that's the area that most of the, the time is taken on 
in these trade negotiations, trying to uh, conf get standards con to conform so that labor won't undercut labor in your own country or so that you know, um, machinery is uh, supposed allegedly equally safe, you know, that cars are equally safe and so on. I mean, all these things make trade negotiations quite different from the sort of thing we read about in the textbooks. So non-tariff barriers are a big, big part of the story and I mean, <clears throat> that's also true you know, of what's happening with, with Brexit. I, mean, I think that um, the EU's biggest fear is that Britain could become some sort of a, a cheap entrepot offshore Europe you know, and compete with Europe. And that's why they're so anxious to have an agreement that ties Britain up in all kinds of knots. Okay, I've spoken already probably too long. Um, to conclude, I've said that there were four serious impediments to China sort of turning things around quickly and therefore stimulating trade. I won't repeat those. Um, for the rest, I think the trade prospects for the moment, unfortunately, are rather subdued. Um, I think equally though the inflation risks which were uh, uh, repeated ad nauseam in the first nine months of last year uh, remain overstated. Um, that's not going to be a problem anytime soon. Um, there's some risk of a downturn from central banks squeezing too much or unintentionally tightening, uh, but hopefully they won't do that. Um, and then some of these other items, which I haven't talked about, like the yield curve inversions, excess leverage, trade wars, on their own, in my opinion, will not cause a recession. So the biggest risk is still that central banks over tighten. Um, but hopefully we won't see that. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to collect my coins back. <laughs> <laughs> We thought you'd forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um, as you will notice from the rundown, um, what we thought we'd do is at least partially counterbalance John with some remarks from our own Bill Stacey. Uh, normally, we wouldn't introduce Bill, which is extremely unfair, because although he's a Lion Rock director, it doesn't mean he should be introduced. <coughs> now, Bill uh, was educated at the University of Western Australia and no doubt other places too, uh, and at Melbourne Business School uh, for his MBA. Uh, he's been a banker, which is where I first met him. Uh, he's been in private equity. Earlier on, he was an economist. Um, and now he's CIO at the Hingrich Foundation. And of course, as most of you will know, he was chairman of the Lion Rock Institute for 10 years. Uh, but apart from his private sector experience, he was also chairman of an Australian group negotiating trade and services and no doubt non-tariff barriers um, during the gap period. So he has quite an interesting background, which is also a balance of, of government-related work and private sector-related work. So he's well suited to give a complimentary view on these issues um, to John. Uh, when Bill has finished his remarks, uh, the two of them will then form their own small panel uh, and fight it out to the death. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I'd like to um, uh, just explore a little bit further um, some of the issues around trade and some of the micro details within trade. Um, I should say though my framework for understanding these things is very much informed by the sort of approach to thinking of money credit as a driver that, um, that John has and I'm sure that um, many years ago in Kalgoorlie where I first picked up a copy of Asia Monetary Monitor that I picked up some of my framework and way of thinking about it um, uh, from, from John and I simply embellished that by reading Friedman and others, um, uh, others later. So um, 
in terms of those trade things, I suppose the underlying issue that I'd like to sort of raise for discussion is the picture of does this sort of strategic trade approach that um, uh, that is talked about now of, of the current administration of Trump in particular does it have any prospect of actually working? Um, and, and so, given the background that, that, that John's outlined of what the real drivers are, I suppose. Fundamentally, I'm going to argue that, that it's not going to get very far. Um, Cato Institute and Dan Hannon have done a really nice piece of work together to talk about what a free trade agreement might look like for the UK and the US if the UK can extricate itself from its um, EU obligations. And, and what they're trying to do is find an agreement that looks very different to what they think of as most of the free trade agreements in the past or in the post-war period, which they describe as really essentially mercantilist reciprocity. Um, so what they mean by that is in, in the post-war period, what John outlined as, um, as the, the GATT and then WTO, we've had this sort of evolution uh, of managed trade agreements where one country offers concessions in exchange for access to other markets. And they point out that this has a really perverse incentive because what it means is that the stock of barriers that you have, which is really part of what John outlined in that OECD chart that many have plenty of, they then become assets that you can use to bargain and negotiate for more access. And really I think in many ways this is the, the core of the language around the dispute between the, the US uh, and China at the moment. Um, they're saying that those conditions of reciprocity, mercantilist reciprocity, have not been met by one of the party to those agreements, China. Uh, but when you think of it, this imbroglio is a really logical outcome of the rather odd system that's been built up uh, and which in many ways um, uh, China didn't start. So, I just wanted to remind us that, um, that there is an alternative um, to this, and it's a more radical vision that uh, The Economist founded itself promoting. I know we've got someone who's from The Economist sitting over there next to Nick. Um, uh, that, um, that, that free trade, um, as uh, once promoted, once experienced, is, um, is a better alternative. So I have a quote from um, Ludwig von Mises. He said, the basic idea of the foreign trade policy of the United States, and he was writing this in his book Liberalism in 1927, is to impose on all goods produced abroad at lower costs import duties to the full amount of that difference in costs. What renders the whole situation grotesque um, is the fact that all countries want to decrease their imports, but at the same time increase their exports. The effect of these policies is to interfere with the international division of labour and thereby to generally lower the productivity of labour. The only reason that this has not become more noticeable is that the advances of the capitalist system have always been, so far, sufficient to outweigh it. However, there can be no doubt that everyone today would be richer if the protective tariff did not artificially drive production from more favourable to less favourable localities. So just to update that quote from 1927, which in many ways sounds depressingly similar to our current environment and certainly that desire of everybody to export more and um, uh, um, it is that a lot of the barriers are not tariffs, as, as John um, uh, showed, uh, showed very effectively. I think another thing is that we're clearly, given the broad growth outlook that John set out, in an environment where the advances of the capitalist system are not really outweighing those costs as much as they had. The constraints on productivity are big and growing, and therefore the risk that these um, barriers to um, trade that we have tariff and non-tariff um, really can, uh, call, can be far more meaningful than they might have been at various points in the past. Um, so I just want to give a few examples of the consequences of the um, trading system, uh, or sorry, of the trade imbroglio that we have um, at the moment. 
And, and in particular, note that you know, we have had, during the period where tariffs were increased a lot, quite a sharp slowdown um, in exports, um, in global demand. Q3 was a little bit weaker, Q4 was weaker still. There are a lot of drivers of that um, in addition. But I just want to give you a couple of micro examples to what's been happening with real businesses. Um, I'll start with washing machines. So washing machines are interesting because the US imposed tariffs on washing machines a little bit earlier as part of um, uh, reciprocal tariffs. And tariffs were imposed from the 7th of February um, on washing machines from um, China. The interesting thing is for the last five years, um, laundry equipment costs had gone down by 27% over those five years. So, so the costs were going down. That seems like a good thing for consumers. Um, now, before the seventh of um, uh, the announcement was seventh of February, before the tariffs were actually imposed, there'd been a surge of imports. So, imports of laundry equipment went up from 1.5 billion to uh, 4 billion immediately before the tariff was imposed. The interesting thing is after the tariff increase, um, prices rose by 20%, um, but they rose not just on the tariff products, um, the imported ones, but also on domestic products as well. So right across the board, um, uh, prices went up on both imported and non-imported um, laundry equipment. The other interesting thing is that it wasn't just washing machines, it was also dryers. And dryers hadn't been tariffed. So what you see is a perfectly natural sort of response of confusion amongst the purchasers about what prices would be, um, and producers taking the opportunity, um, as Adam Smith would have uh, predicted when they got together, to sort of shift all prices up. Um, they thought that they um, had an advantage by doing so. They were wrong. Um, unit sales fell by 18% in May, 21% in June. They're now a third of what they were before prices went up because consumers quite naturally responded to higher prices um, with less demand. Um, this should have all been fairly predictable. Um, to uh, not be partisan in washing machines in 2015, the Obama administration put a 35% tariff on washing machines from China. Um, the interesting thing is they weren't from China. They had been diverted from South Korea because the Obama administration had earlier put a 35% tariff on washing machines from South Korea. So the Koreans managed to uh, ship them across the border and bring them in um, via China. It's okay though, washing machine exports from China went to zero after the tariff was imposed. Interestingly, um, exports from Vietnam started to pick up. So total imports didn't change at all. There might have been a production shift, um, or, or maybe there were just some rather creative book entries. That's washing machines, that was productive. I'll talk about almonds now. So um, almonds, um, You'll note that uh, California is the biggest producer of almonds in the world. 80% of, of global almonds come from there. If you're an almond milk drinker, non-dairy, um, it's one of the bigger areas, but almonds, big and growing areas, seen as very healthy. China um, put retaliatory tariffs um, of 50% on almonds in July. And um, the China percentage of US exports up until September which is when I've got the uh, most recent data, it's getting a bit hard to get data from the US at the moment, um, fell from 8.4% to 7.1% um, of US exports, so a meaningful fall, um, didn't collapse to zero. Um, that was nice for um, Carmen and my home country of, uh, of Australia. Australia um, almond exports to China went up from 1.8% uh, of Australian almonds to China to 13.4% of Australian almonds to China. The interesting thing is from 2019, under the FTA Australia has with China, um, almonds will be tariff free. However, Australian almond exports to India fell by 18% um, as the US started to export 
for things that couldn't be exported to China to India, which is also one of the bigger markets for um, almonds globally. Interestingly, the US also, understanding the game that China was playing, route almonds into China through Vietnam. Um, useful um, and very pragmatic, the, uh, our friends from uh, Vietnam. Um, there was no value added from any of this shifting around in almond volumes. Um, there are better and worse almonds, so I believe I don't eat nuts, but um, they are essentially a commodity. This is just um, dead weight loss, loss of brand investment, loss of management time um, and resources responding to survive. Um, you know, those of us in business and commerce, we do it. We have to uh, have to survive. Sorry, important information. I might uh, try and take away, um, uh, but uh, but it's not helpful. Uh, steel. The U.S. imposed 25% tariffs on steel from um, many countries, not just China. Um, flat steel prices, especially some of the the higher quality, jumped by about 50% in the U.S. Um, uh, steel prices in the US, which have been amongst the lowest in the world, um, became comfortably above a number of other countries um, in, in a number of important categories of steel, which is not really a commodity, obviously. Um, even in the PPI measure, in the broad data of finished steel products, prices are up by 21% as a result for all steel, and that's all steel, whether imported or um, domestic. Um, now, US steel exports, because the US is actually a very fine producer of some very good quality steel, fell by 35% in a quarter as a result of retaliatory measures. And although total US steel output is actually up by about 10% or so, there's a data point for uh, people that want to cite that in favor of it, um, the impact on demand um, overall has um, clearly been uh, so clearly been negative and, um, uh, and demand uh, in a lot of categories is probably down 20 or 30 percent and it's clearly starting to feed into a lot of other prices and margins in other industries and if you listen to conference calls of US manufacturers, whether it's uh, the auto players, Caterpillar, um, the, uh, uh, the airlines, um, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, aircraft producers, Boeing, um, uh, cost of goods is going up um, and it's a negative for them. Um, markets are extremely responsive, uh, auto parts. Um, recently, very recently after the truce, China decided to remove um, the additional tariffs they put on auto parts. And so immediately um, Costco, big Chinese shipper, says that their backhaul shipping from the US, which is normally running around 40%, so China does ship a lot more to the US than comes back, um, increased from about 40% to 48% and almost all of that difference was auto parts from the US back to China. So you know, the reaction function of markets to this is very quick and the point there is you know, don't trivialise that um, the impacts of tariffs can be really very real. If I could just cite one more um, example of perhaps perverse impacts. You'll all know that um, the US was going to boom because of a massive corporate tax cut that was um, bravely put through by a Congress that um, prioritised, fortunately, tax cuts over a wall. Um, we're now onto walls. US collections of corporate taxes from the period of September to November this year, as a consequence, are about $16.3 billion um, lower than they were a year ago. You know, a real tax cut, money in people's pockets, clearly a good thing. However, the increase in excise and custom duties that we've seen from September to November adds up to $19.3 billion more than the same period the year before. So in many ways, all the good work done by the administration in the corporate tax cut in the last sort of quarter or so has been used up by new taxes and inputs that the government put, have put in place, um, which has prompted the president to say, look, our um, budget deficit is getting smaller and aren't tariffs a good thing? Um, there's a bit of a consistency problem, but um, uh, he's clearly learning how to be a politician these days. So that's just a series of examples, I suppose, of how the tariff and the trade 
um, picture has what I think are simple deadweight costs um, that are a burden on business, a negative for growth, and undermine um, uh, productivity. Um, and, and I think this is going to flow through more into the data, perhaps reinforce some of the underlying trends that have other causes. Um, clearly, in the US, there's been a bring forward of imports and shipments, followed by a build-up of inventories, a need to clear those inventories, and that's impacted output and growth. Um, there have also been impacts of prices um, on demand, and all of these things are, are, are real costs. Um, you will have seen headlines about China. Um, I won't, uh, I think, better for us to discuss things a little bit further, but I just wanted to add a couple of points for um, uh, your potential um, controversy that, um, that we can discuss. One is that there is implicit in the debate about trade a picture that um, China's economic success um, uh, comes from the link between the state sector and the private sector. And I'd like to suggest that overwhelmingly, I think, the economic growth that China has had has come from a very competitive and genuine private sector. The, the trade goods sectors um, in many parts of um, uh, industry in China have been very market-driven and highly competitive. And you know, success requires a lot more of making your customers happy than the NDRC. And, and that China learning that has led to a lot of the very good export outcomes that they have had. Of course, China has SOEs and a big state sector. But I think, by and large, these are a drag on enterprises, a negative for growth. The past year is a cost to doing business, not an aid to doing business and it makes Chinese enterprises less competitive, not more. So, you know, whilst I'd be very hopeful that we might get good outcomes out of the negotiations that are in place at the moment, I'd remind you of Napoleon's overused quote, um, let China sleep, when she wakes, she will shake the world, that if China does remove those um, overhangs, those barriers, that might indeed lead to benefits in productivity that will help us to overcome some of the challenges in China um, that, that John outlined. And a very final point, we talk a lot about trade. When Mises was writing in 1927, he was very, very clear that the free movement of people was an essential that was as important as the free movement of goods. Um, he indeed was very explicit about what this meant. He was very critical of Australia and the United States and their restrictions um, on immigration. He said, what's wrong if a majority of people in the continent of Australia come from Japan, China, um, and the Malaysian Peninsula? He said that's very likely to happen because the people there don't use most of the land that's there at the moment. And if someone else can use it better, um, surely that would be a good thing. But the other point that he made was that the reason why this becomes a problem, the reason why there is fear in countries, is because the role of the state has become so big. And no one wants to give up power over their own life to a government that they might see as alien or from people that are different, look different. They want to control their own lives. And the thing that makes immigration a problem um, is not other people and where they come from. It's wonderful if other people can um, uh, can move to places where they can be more productive. The US, rather than moving capital to China, the alternative would have been to move Chinese people to all of the capital that there was in what became the Rust Belt. Um, but obviously there was some reluctance to do that. Um, the reason why these things don't happen um, is because the state is too big and too powerful um, and, uh, and creates resentments and fears that we would be better without. So. Um, immigration might be a little bit too much for us to debate today, but um, we've got lots of other things to talk about. If I could invite John to um, join me in our seats. So perhaps I could... Perhaps I could start by asking sort of John a question, which is around China. Um, there is obviously a lot of uh, latent potential in China for productivity improvement that, that, that I alluded to, that you alluded to, with some uh, pessimism about their prospects under the current um, uh, um, uh, president, um, 
uh, for um, making those changes. Um, I'm wondering, um, could we perhaps talk a little bit about, you know, there is a lot of policy announcements in China. In many ways, it seems that they see the charts that you've put up there and are responding in an appropriate way by talking about tax cuts that they've not really done um, before. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts about the, the, the raft of changes that we see in China at the moment. Well, uh, I hesitate to pontificate about China. I come here <coughs> three or four times a year, <coughs> and a lot of my time is taken up with other countries. But it does seem to me that uh, their priorities have not been on the microeconomic reforms that I mentioned. Um, it would be uh, highly desirable to have um, a reorganization of the SOE area, um, but that seems to be off the agenda. Um, because, for instance, I mean, if just take that area, if you if you don't remove them, then it seems to me that next time we have another boom, we will get the same problem of access capacity. It might not be in identical industries, but it, in in the same way, because. Those decisions to build those plants were essentially politically driven. They were comp there was competition between the provinces. You know, next door province has a steel mill. We want to have a steel mill, so we're going to build a steel mill. And that way, you get you know, there's no consideration really of what is my rate of return going to be, and so you get a lot of capital wasted, and that's very damaging. Um, so, yeah, there's huge scope for productivity improvement, but it's got that productivity improvement relies on capital being allocated to the right sectors, um, and all of that needs a market basis, uh, not the state directing it. You made a comment mm. that um, the renminbi um, uh, had uh, had weakened somewhat, notwithstanding monetary policy being um, being fairly tight. We're now in a position where interest rates have become much lower. Interest rates aren't the same as monetary policy. Um, uh, there's no strong signs yet of broader monetary aggregates really picking up from those levels. Um, but I suppose two questions. One would be, how important do you think that the renminbi is for the pitch around trade and trade tensions, and and and, and what do you think the, the near term outlook for the exchange rate is? Well, I think the um, the scope for allowing the renminbi B to depreciate further is now very limited given the relationships with the United States. Uh, and the, the, the focus of other Asian economies on that level. So while it might have been feasible earlier, that's also one of the constraints they face. Um, I think that uh, you can gain something by reducing your exchange rate, but not very much. I mean, that, that's a price change. What the real gains come from taking advantage of volume growth uh, and improving your competitiveness at the going price level. Right? Those are the two things you want to aim for. So if you organize, manipulate your currency downwards, um, you, know, you will gain a, a temporary advantage, but probably be lost. Um, so it, it's not, it's not going to give you a, a great staying power, I don't think. John. Um, John. Thanks, Bill and, and um, John. So I've got some complicated questions, um, and it's going to be kind of leading. You know, I, I kind of think of the world where we've had QE for the last eight years, and most of the effects of that are coming to an end, and the policy effects of that are coming to an end. Japan has tried it for 20 years. It's not led to any nominal GDP growth. All it's done is finance a fiscal deficit, which finances the output gap for demand. So one 
conclusion I could draw is that we're all Japan, it's just a matter of time. And with the exceptions of maybe we're the UK, which is that we realize we're less productive, we're less competitive, we're kind of part of a global um, system where we're too small to be a big continental player and we try to free ourselves from that in a different way. So what I'm trying to question is, you know, you look at the monetary indi uh, indicators of growth, you think it's a central bank policy, but I wonder whether that's masking much bigger um, demographic problems, much bigger um, taxation or overregulation policy problems, that it's masking uh, bigger debt problems, where within those 1930 cycles and those, you know, there were a lot of debt crises of emerging economies. There's, so I'm wondering is that there's a lot more um, structural problems and that we're either, you're either going to see countries that go down the Japan route that have the flexibility to do it or down the UK route tries to free themselves. And I love your perspective on it because you've got obviously historical perspective but I don't, I don't have. Sure, well let me go back to what you said at the beginning. Um, that is that we've had QE for a number of years now in different countries. But it's important to understand that the QE conducted in those different countries has been very different. Um, by and large, we've had two models of QE. One model, operated by the Fed and by the Bank of England, purchased, had the central bank purchasing securities from non-banks. Uh, and what that meant was that when the seller of the securities, that seller being an insurance company, a pension fund, um, an institutional saver, a could be an individual or a business, doesn't matter, but that seller would then receive a check, effectively, from the central bank and deposit that in his or her bank. That is new money in the system. Okay? So the real key to QE is not what it did to interest rates but what it did to the quantity of money. In both the US and the UK, it prevented what would otherwise have been a much greater decline, and it ensured that we never <clears throat> went to negative interest rates, because there was enough money being created for interest rates to remain positive. But then you have another model of QE operated initially in Japan between 2001 and 2006, and then in Japan from uh, 2015, no, 2013, I think, and then uh, the Eurozone from 2015. That model is very different. Under that model, those central banks have bought their securities almost entirely from banks. And that has a very different effect. If I'm the central bank and I buy from you as a bank, I credit your account at the central bank. I obviously get the securities, so I central bank's balance sheet has increased. But the commercial bank's balance sheet that has sold that security, its balance sheet hasn't increased at all. It now has a credit at the central bank in place of the security that it used to hold. <clears throat> There has been no increase in money held by the public, money held by firms and individuals. There's no increase in the money supply. And as a result, no increase in purchasing power. And that's why QE looks to have failed in Japan and in the Eurozone. And it's also, incidentally, why in those areas, Europe and Japan, they've had negative interest rates. It's no coincidence that because they've pursued this mistaken model of QE, they've ended up having to push rates down and down and down until it did something. Well, it never, never was going to do anything. Because under that model of QE, it would require the banks to start making loans. But even the US banks weren't making loans initially, nor were the British banks because of you know, all of the problems of 2008, 9, and so on. So I, I would downplay the role that you, of these things that you kind of mentioned, aging and demographics and all that sort of stuff. Inflation is fundamentally a monetary phenomenon. It's a matter of how much money there is in the system chasing how many goods and services. 
And um, <clears throat> that's by far the dominant driver of inflation. If you take your eye off that ball and you focus on other things, you're liable to get very distracted. So I don't think that um, you know, it, it is so complicated, but I do think that the economics profession and the central banks have been obsessed with the wrong things, like, as I mentioned, the unbelievable how people went on last year for the first six or nine months about you know, the, the US economy becoming overheated and the dangers of the Phillips curve um, triggering inflation, etc., etc. Uh, and yet, all the time, money growth was anemic, and so we've had a slowing economy. You had a bit of a toss offline about uh, Europe fearing that Britain could become a cheap uh, entrepot offshore. Uh, could you tell us, I haven't heard that idea, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Is this Spaniards are going to be buying holiday homes in Dover? and? British plumbers are going to be headed for Warsaw, and Czech louts are going to be going to go up the piss and in Birmingham. Like, what, what does this look like? How could that happen? Well, that's right. Um, it's, I think it's a fear, um, but it's not very likely to be implemented because Britain, like all these other European countries, <coughs> like the US, has subscribed to these minimum safety standards, minimum health standards, minimum uh, agricultural uh, standards, etc. Um, but uh, there are areas uh, where we could compete and, or where we could lower tariffs dramatically. I mean, one thing that I remind people of a lot in Europe um, is uh, the coffee market. I don't know if you know, but um, coffee beans uh, compete with your almond story. <laughs> Coffee beans in Europe are tariffed at 15% raw coffee beans. Well, nobody in Europe grows coffee. There's, the climate's not right. Not even in Turkey do they grow coffee. Um, if you import roasted coffee beans, the tariff is I can't remember, 30 or 35%. But if you import ground roasted coffee beans, the tariff is 75%. Why on earth? Because we have lots of coffee grinders in France, in Italy, in Germany, in Holland, and so on, whose comfortable little businesses would be undermined. As a sort of general policy, this inhibits the development of Colombian coffee, Jamaican coffee, Malaysian coffee, because they can't build a brand, they can't add value, and then export the product. You know, they have to, they are effectively confined to uh, um, exporting the raw coffee beans, which is very bad news uh, for, for those countries, and I think it's bad policy on the part of the, the Europeans. Uh, and yet, you know, there's lots of examples uh, of this sort of thing. To apply it to what, what I was just discussing, what, what the question was, you know, so Britain, which does, grows no coffee, could have a free market in coffee. And then we would get people, you know, well, not come crossing the border for coffee, but their, their morning fix would be a lot cheaper, right? Um, and maybe we would uh, start, uh, we, we, we would, I mean, the export of coffee into Europe would still be restricted by the tariffs. Uh, but if you apply that to other examples, you know, whether it's appliances or things like that, you can see that fairly soon there would be quite a number of things where Europe would fear competition from a free trading Britain as compared with a Britain which signed up to all the tariffs and standards that the EU implements. John. Um this is going to be a, a technical, very parochial question. So uh, we were talking about a year ago, I think, about the failure of the arbitrage to work in Hong Kong in terms of Hong Kong rates remaining stubbornly below US rates. But going back to your history talk about the country standard, what was the reason that um, 
convertibility of 7.8 was never offered to the general public. I know that was one of your initial proposals, and uh, the government decided against it. But, uh, I'm just thinking in a personal experience of trying to basically get HSBC to give me a decent rate when the dollars at 7.85 and failing. Yeah, they, they didn't want um, people arbitraging <coughs> the, the bank's position of buying Hong Kong dollars at 783, 84, 85 in the market and going for bank and then saying, you know, give me US dollars. Um, so, so yeah, the other so, way around. So it's Hong Kong free market work. So they, yeah, I mean, it, in the days of convertibility, deviations from the official rate were very small. That's my understanding. Uh, be because everybody had that ability to convert. Um, so uh, I think they were concerned about it, and they also they didn't want the HKMA to have to deal with members of the public. Um, they didn't want the public lining up you know, outside the big banks again. Um, so all those sorts of things came into it. But it was more, I suppose, just, now we'll just keep things as they are. Uh, thanks, Bill. John. Um, I just have a, a question about um, uh, capitalism with socialist characteristics, Chinese characteristics. So there's a lot that I don't understand, but on, on occasion I come across a, uh, an economist here in Hong Kong who will say, "You don't understand. You don't understand the level of control that the." Uh, Chinese government has on all aspects in China, including the economy. And when they need to, they will step in and fix problems as they see it, and these administrative tools as opposed to market tools. Um, there's still uh, cards that they can play. Um, I personally don't understand it. I, I, I test a lot of what you said with this uh, uh, commentators and economists. Um, but we do see it sometimes in, in play, for example, with the uh, injection, with the attempt to inject more money into the, uh, the, into the economy with triple R cuts. It's freeing uh, more liquidity for banks, but banks are choosing not to lend them that money to growth areas because they still see it as not profitable. So you have direction from the Chinese government to banks to say you must lend that as part of national service, I think it's the, the, the term, um, to uh, particularly the private sector, because that's where the Chinese government recognise that. So these sorts of tools, where uh, is is this something that we are not understanding? Is this uh, that that the the Chinese government has uh, been able to play, or potentially could play in the future, that we don't, as uh, Western liberal economists? Perhaps understand. Um, no, I think those are those are areas where they are behaving in in a normal sort of way. I mean, the banks are going to be reluctant to lend to entities that are already over leveraged. So, uh, as Western banks were in 2009, 10, 11, 12, you know, there really wasn't any lending going on to the household sector to. Um, leveraged financial companies. And maybe the Chinese banks are reacting in the same sort of way now. Um, I, don't, I don't know enough about it to be able to say. Um, all I was saying was that you know, they, they're not free to kind of step on the accelerator in the way that they did in 2008, 2009, when balance sheets were all in good shape and you know, there, there really wasn't a problem. Now the balance sheets uh, certainly for large parts of the economy, you know, the corporate sector, there's much more debt. So there's a marked, likely to be a marked reluctance you know, to just step on the accelerator. Um, on the triple R and things like that, what you've got to be careful about is, the headline says this will inject another 650 billion RMB or whatever. But what you don't know and what's happening at the same time is how many loans are being repaid, mm. what the bank's view is on 
how many more loans they're going to make. So that's only one small moving part in a whole picture. So it's just a, just a temporary headline. It's, it's not you know, any indication of growth. If I could add a, a couple of things. One is that the regulators are certainly acting as if they're constrained. They're not acting as if they have a very high level of confidence that, um, uh, that that's consistent with what you're saying. They're acting as if they have a nuanced view of the fundamental constraints. And they engineered the decline in monetary growth because they had a deliberate desire to deleverage because they were extremely concerned about their variants of shadow banking that had been recycling the credit risks and the disasters that came in from the response to 2008 and 2009 and was simply recycling that credit risk, socialising, if you want a better word, the credit risk amongst a broader and broader um, a group of people within China through at one stage trust products and then at a, a, another stage peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, a, a, um, uh, uh, um, a, a different types of um, uh, intermediary products. Um, and then uh, on the triple R cut, um, uh, last week courtesy of uh, UBS, um, uh, former governor of Central Bank Joel was saying um, look, don't worry about that, it's just before Chinese New Year, um, we do that sort of thing all the time. Um, besides, you have to look at what happens to open market operations at the same time and they're moving the other way. Um, uh, and so, you know, what you've seen so far is actually a very normal annual cycle. And he said, I thought really interestingly, this monetary policy stuff that, that we do, you know, it's quite interesting because markets respond to it. People like you seem to pay a lot of attention to it, and we can use that in a useful way. Um, but, uh, but really what's going to matter this time is fiscal things, and the fiscal things will take time, and we're going to reduce taxes, and we're going to try and do some microeconomic reforms, and, and those things will have to wait for NPC. They'll take a little bit of time. So you know, it's interesting that at the very top level, He's talking in a more nuanced way um, uh, as well. He also made what I thought were either brave or interesting comments about um, political challenges in making the micro reforms, some of which John alluded to, and obviously of which there's a, 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 long, um, a long list of. Um, for what it's worth, it seems to me that there is something of a rearguard action from what you might call something like the Sinhua clique and people that had some link to Zhu Rongji to try and get more microeconomic reform than, um, uh, than has happened in recent years. Whether that's successful or not, we'll see, because there obviously is this latent potential in China for um, productivity improvement that, that could make what's otherwise a bleak art look, look a little bit better. Um, I'm struggling for a silver lining on tariffs and the effects of tariffs. Um, <clears throat> we haven't really talked about the degree of change in the Chinese economy you know, over the periods, e even the period since the, since the um, 2008 crisis, but certainly longer than that. Uh, what happens in China at the micro level has been changing all the time and changing much faster than in the West. <clears throat> now, if the tariff impositions on China are imposed on the areas where they're currently very successful in producing and exporting, I mean, one silver lining might be that over time this will force businesses in China to look for new areas and not sitting on what they've been making good profits on forever. Yeah. And so actually um, one benefit of this type of Trump activity is to accelerate change in the Chinese economy, which in the longer run will benefit them. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, the best example of this is, is the experience with Japan. When I was living in Japan in the 70s, the big argument was between the US and Japan over, over textiles and later steel. So what did Japan do? Um, they had a campaign to move into higher value added goods. They moved into electronics and later robotics and cars and so on. And so higher value added uh, products were exported. I mean, one of the main effects of this Trump trade war is going to accelerate China's move to higher value added uh, production, no, no question about it. <coughs> 
Um, I had some <coughs> survey data of what Chinese companies were saying they were doing, which I thought is quite consistent with that and, uh, and a little interesting. Um, uh, they said um, uh, that 86% uh, of companies with tariff products said they had ordered declines that were 10 to 30%, so they have to respond. 90% um, of companies said that they'd ship things early to avoid the tariffs. 68% of companies said they'd reduce prices, um, presumably to offset some of the tariff impact. 23% had cut headcount, um, and 27% had reduced capex, so they're becoming more efficient, they're responding. Obviously, governments and central ministries aren't gonna say, um, you know, we think you should be reducing your numbers, but companies are doing that. So by displaying autonomy, I mean, they're capturing an element of, I think, commercial freedom that they might not otherwise have felt they, um, they had. 64% said that they had um, seek non-US markets. Um, and 50% of exporters to the US said they've already moved some of their production overseas in the last 12 months. So that's to the point about, I suppose, regional supply chains becoming more integrated and creating um, opportunities to add value. And a further 44% said they plan to over the next 12 months. The interesting thing is that the favoured countries to move production to are um, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, not Southeast Asia. And so that tells you something too about, again, what John was saying, what do the Chinese companies know they lack? Um, it, you know, it's the higher value added, um, the, the productive skills, perhaps the management talent, that they wouldn't find if they were just shifting it to lower cost Southeast Asia. John, I was interested in the, the, the currency implications of your business cycle analysis, particularly the money and credit uh, analysis. If you were running a portfolio based in Hong Kong and you were looking at one to two years, typically you would buy a currency if it was money supply was uh, weak or if growth was strong. But if you're looking at all of the major economies that you're looking at on your charts, they all look somewhat similar. So if you were a, a portfolio manager here based in US dollars or, or Hong Kong dollars, which would be the currencies that you would be looking to hedge depreciation risk over a one to two, two year view? Well, I always, I always say to people, what's really important first is to get the asset allocation right. That is, whether you're in equities or real estate or bonds or cash, and currency is really sort of secondary to all of that. Um, I mean, there are people who focus exclusively on currency, but it's very difficult for an ordinary investor to make money consistently in currency. Um, so I, I wouldn't use these kind of tools you know, to make currency decisions. Um, movements are much too short, sharp, and rapid you know, uh, to benefit from this kind of and, and traders who have acted on these kinds of things you know, long ago. So I don't think it's really a good way to go about currency trading. Sorry to duck the answer, but that, that really is the case. So, whereas you can get you know, the asset allocation broadly correct if you understand where you are in the business cycle. I'll let uh, take, take this next one and then maybe take one more. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, Bill, I'm glad you, you brought up the, the Southeast Asia piece. That was a, I wanted to address a question um, to both of you. Uh, so this is the topic, it was Asian, implications for Asian trade. Maybe you could just say a little bit about uh, the ASEAN countries and, and South Asia, particularly India. Um, their prospects, uh, what do you think is it interesting <coughs> for them, upside or downside. Uh, well, I think India is, is in good shape, generally. And unlike many other countries, India's kept its debt levels relatively low. And the inflation they've dealt with over the last decade um, most of the hard work was already done before Rajan became uh, central bank governor and uh, by and large despite the sort of current disputes between the, the government and the central bank it looks as though that's still intact so uh, 
money credit growth have not excessive in India. Um, so that's hopefully, that's a reason why the balance of payments has improved and why the currency hasn't depreciated as rapidly as it was doing you know, up until five, six years ago. Um, so I think India is a reasonable bet from an sort of equity investment standpoint. And while the inflation rate was coming down, the bond market was fine too. Whether we've seen the end of that or not, I'm not sure, but um, we're nearer the end of that than, than the beginning of it. Um, and then uh, <coughs> the rest of Southeast Asia, I mean, well, uh, the, sort of the ASEAN area. I don't really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to give investment advice, and I, I don't really follow ASEAN closely enough to say, but. My understanding is that most of the countries have managed their affairs pretty well, I, you know, to the extent I follow them. Um, there might be one or two outliers who have um, lost the discipline a bit, but nothing too egregious, I don't think. Um, and, uh, well, I don't think I should say more about that. You know, I don't have a professional opinion. Just to compliment a little bit, I think, one of the key differentiators is probably openness to foreign, invest, foreign direct investment, the willingness of companies to invest in things that will upgrade the quality of productivity, quality of labor and other things. Vietnam's done a pretty reasonable job. The investments of the Koreans and the Japanese, Taiwanese in Vietnam, as well as Chinese in Vietnam, is all sort of material because I think they've shown a reasonable willingness in Southeast Asia, um, there are a lot of um, political, cultural, and other constraints on foreign direct investment, um, and uh, and I think that makes it um, a little bit harder for them to uh, make some of the changes that they should. But it's always open to be more open. Uh, hi, John. Thank you very much for coming to visit. Uh, two two brief questions. Um, first of all. On, to pick up on something Simon mentioned, on the arbitrage between highball and libel and the linked exchange rate mechanism. Um, what's your current thinking on why one month or three month tenor interbank rates between Hong Kong dollars and US dollars are not more quickly <coughs> um, equalizing, if you like, given that the exchange rate has been with us for such a long time, it's very transparent, it's very credible, so that's one. Is it the interbank rates are not the thing to look at anymore? I understand London's going to do away with LIBOR. Maybe we should be looking at something else. So that's one. And then a, a completely diff a different kind of question. So on one of your charts, you had a picture of uh, US money growth and shadow, um, a proxy for the shadow system, which has started to move up. Do you think that that shadow line can go a lot higher? I mean, um, is it because, you know, due to Volcker rules, there's been a relaxation on on the constraints on US banks, and that's going to keep on shooting up through through the zero line and and um, become a bigger issue. Or what's your opinion of the growth of the shadow banking system in the US? Thank you. Okay. Well, on the first, I think it all has to do with the margin that the HKMA maintains. Given that we've got this margin from 775 to 785, these convertibility bands. Um, there's quite a lot of latitude you know, for deviation of the rates between the US and Hong Kong. Um, and that differential is, uh, what is that, it's about 1.3%, something like that. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's not negligible. And since the rate could move quite a bit. Um, people are unsure about you know, taking a, a flyer. I think that if that rate, if those rates, the convertibility band was narrowed, uh, then the convergence would be a lot tighter. But Hong Kong is anxious to maintain an active foreign exchange market. And so I think they're reluctant to close that band. <clears throat> Incidentally, on um, LIBOR, well, 
yes, LIBOR is going to be replaced, but there will be another alternative benchmark. Um, however, the other countries, so the other side of it, the other IBORs, HIBOR or SIBOR or SHIBOR or whatever, these countries are not going to be able to um, have enough transactions to get a significantly different or a transactions based benchmark. So probably what we'll see is some move to tighten up the governance surrounding the submission of rates for the determination of HIBOR or CYBOR or whatever. Um, I think that's about the limit of it. On the shadow banking, there's two ways to compile shadow banking data. One is you can look at the institutions. And the chart that I showed you giving the sort of fluctuations was based on institutions. The other way to do it is to look at the instruments and top them up. And you can, if you look at things like the market in asset-backed securities, commercial paper, um, these have been essentially flat to declining. Um, so that there's no sign of recovery in those areas. Um, there's been, I said, a little bit of recovery in repos, but I'm not sure that that's really related to the changes in the application of the FOCA rules to some of the smaller banks. So I don't think that the, the rules have yet relaxed enough to kind of release the animal spirits to drive a big surge uh, in shadow banking yet. What we're seeing is more, and this is kind of noise actually, the numbers having moved positive, it's, it's still bumping along the bottom. It's not a sustained upswing. And if, if you have a pretty bumpy series, you, know, you can get random movements like that. So it's not, I don't think it's the start of any upswing, no.